We also have three different types of firewall policies. We have a domain policy. The domain policy is what you're under if you've authenticated by if you've been authenticated by a domain controller. If you haven't been authenticated by a domain controller, then the operating system is going to assume that you're in a public network and it's considered to be a very insecure environment. But it'll pop up a dialog box and say, hey, is this, a, uh, is this a public network or is this a private network? And if you say private, it'll go into the private policy. If you say public, it'll go into the public policy. And if you've authenticated into the domain, you'll be under the domain policy. So we have three different firewall policies that we could be under and which one we're under really depends upon have we talked to a domain controller and have you told me whether it's private or public. So those are the, the definitions. So let's go ahead and show you how we can make these. We're going to go into assets and compliance. We're under endpoint protection. And we're going to bring up the Windows Defender firewall policies. Notice that we don't have one by default. So I'm going to right click on it. We're going to create a brand new one. And we will give it a name. So we'll say C-O-R-P-F-I-R-E-W-A-L-L-P-O-L-I-C-Y. And then we'll say next. And uh, it's going to ask us, we have, um, we have the domain, we have private, and we have public. And so we have the settings, and we can turn them on or turn them off at each of these levels. So the first thing that we say, are we going to turn on the firewall? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say yes. Yes and yes. Now, normally I would turn these on with a group policy. But since we're managing everything with System Center, I'll just do it in System Center. And it's actually a, a better, it's more advantageous because then I don't have to hook it to a particular organizational unit. I can do it to a collection, for example. Uh, block incoming connections. Now, this is all incoming connections. Um, let, me, let me illustrate that. I'll go over here. So here I have my machine. And on this machine, do I not have my, there we go. Had to turn my ink on. My ink was a little low. So here I have my machine, and on my machine, I may have a variety of applications. All right, are you going to draw for me here, or are we just, uh, are we just playing around here? I told you I was out of ink, man. Nobody believes me. Draw. Why are you not drawing? Ah, goodness gracious. All right, we'll go old school. Uh, maybe. Here we go. All right, so I have uh, I have my computer. Wow, it's not even drawn with the mouse. That's crazy talk. Wow, that's really bizarre. All right, so uh, what happens is is that you have a system here, and on the system you have to have something that will allow you to go through and you want to be able to control which applications come in, and we also want to determine. Um, when the applications come in, is it an allowed application and who does it go to? Now, this is all about the OSI um, model that we have. We have uh, all sorts of different layers that we have in OSI. And what we want to do is, is we want to try and um, allow certain applications in while we are blocking <laughs> while we're blocking other applications out. Well, I'm trying to go through and get all this stuff set up. Um, and uh, these various layers of the OSI model, you have layer zero, which is the physical layer, doesn't know anything, it's just voltages, goes into layer one, it understands MAC addresses, layer, or, uh, layer one, I'm sorry, it's not layer zero. Layer one is physical, it's just voltages, layer two is MAC address, layer three is IP address. None of these know anything about applications. And so when I get a little bit higher in layer four, we have TCP and UDP. And this is where we start to get towards applications because we will have um, individual port numbers. So for example, if I have, yeah, it's working now. So if I have a server, and let's say that this server is a, um, it's a web server. And so regular HTTP is gonna be using port 80. And if I'm using SSL, it's gonna be using port 443. Remember there's 65,000 plus, 65,000 plus port numbers. And the first 1024, ports 0 through 1023, are what are known as well-known port numbers. They have been assigned by the Internet Assigned Number Authority, the IANA, and they're the ones that say door 80 is for HTTP. But it really boils down to this. It's a client-server application. So I have a server, and I have a client. 
And if I want to use your web server, we both agree that I'm going to go come in on port 80. However, we don't have to use port 80. I can use a non-standard port. I can use any port I want. I just have to make sure both the client and the server agree on which port they're going to use. So if I'm going to use port 8097, then I'd have to make sure that my client knew about port 8097. So what we're going to do is, is we are going to say uh, certain applications are allowed in. Now, the reason that we do this, let me show you. So let's say that I am in the middle of talking to a machine. I say, hey, I want to go to your web services. And since you're just a generic web server, we're going to say port 80. And that is your destination port. Uh, but I'm going to keep track of this particular communications by having a random port assigned to this end. So I'm going to say port 2197, just a random number. So now when I send it to you on port 80, when you reply back, you'll say it's from port 80, but it's to port 2197. And that allows my computer to keep track of which particular data streams coming in. Because think about it. I could have multiple web pages open at the same time, even going to the same machine. And when I request something, it has to know which tab on my browser to bring it in. And the way it differentiates that is with, with the various port numbers. So if I have, a, let's say that I have a line of business app. So we put a line of business app on our server. And on this line of business app on our server, it uses a special port number. We'll say that it uses port 9172. Why 9172? Because the designers thought 9172 would be an awesome port to put on. By default, our server is going to have our Windows firewall. And by default, the Windows firewall is not going to allow port 9172 to be, to, to be initiated to. So if I'm talking out, let's say I'm talking to your port 2197, and then you reply back inside of your TCP packet, you're going to have uh, a setting in there that says, hey, this is an established com communications uh, session. And if I have an established communication session inside the server, it will know that you're already talking to me, so my firewall doesn't have to worry about it because, hey, it's already established and we can communicate. Firewall rules really don't apply that much when it's an established communication. But if the machine on the outside is trying to initiate communications, I don't already have a session on here, the firewall will most definitely block that out. So what I have to do is I have to modify the firewall rule to say, hey, uh, go ahead and allow port 9172 to be exposed. Now you can do it with a port number, you can do it with an executable, you have different options on there. But this is the basis of firewalls. It says, hey, if you initiate communications from the outside, which doors do I want to allow you to connect? And that is why, or that is how we're controlling all this stuff because we're saying whether you come in via the domain, if my server's in a domain, these are the doors that we have open. If I'm in a private network, I may have even more doors open because, hey, you know, it's a protected environment. But if I'm in a public environment, then I'm probably going to want to lock them down a little bit. So this allows you to have different settings depending upon where your machine happens to be. Now, hopefully your servers aren't moving around a whole lot. What about laptop machines? They go to Starbucks, they go to, you know, wherever, and they got free Wi-Fi, woo! That's going to be a public network, and we probably want to harden our walls a little bit more than when they're sitting there in their cubicle behind 47 proxies and 18 firewalls and intrusion detection, sniffing all the packets. Those I could probably reduce my local firewall a little bit. So that's, that's how these, uh, these will work. So if I say enable firewall, we'll say yes. Then I can say block all incoming connections. Essentially what we're doing is we're dropping the shields. And what I'm going to say is if for some reason this machine's uh, under this policy thinks they're in the public, we're going to lock it all down. Now this can be a double-edged sword because if all of a sudden I change the name of my network or I plug you into a different port or I plug into a different modem or I plug into something here or there or everywhere, any time that I do not authenticate off of that network port, it is going to assume that it's public until I tell it it's private, and then it'll pop up a dialog box and say, is this public or is this private? So if I say block everything if it's public, a new machine or a machine that goes into a network that it's not familiar with, it's going to block everything, and it can be a bit of a hassle. So don't just immediately assign, oh, yeah, we'll block everything. So I'm just going to say not configured. I can say, if I am blocking a new program, do you want me to notify you? I can say yes, no, maybe so. 
Uh, typically on my public profile, I, I may or may not notify you. It just depends upon what your settings are, but this is what we have. So you're not going through and you're not specifying any individual components, but what you are doing is you're saying, turn it on, turn it off. And um, are we going to just turn off everything? And are we going to block new programs and notify people? These are the options that we have. So that's what we would do. So I'd say next, next, and it goes through and creates it. And just like any other policy that we've created, of course, we are going to want to push it out to the individual clients. And so if you look over on page 648, you'll see where we assign the policies. So let's go ahead and check this out. So we're going to go into anti-malware policies. We have our policy right here. We would say deploy. And then I would specify the individual collection that we're going to deploy it to. We're going to say line of business servers. I can have my schedule and boom, it is deployed. Now, uh, what's going to happen is, is that the configuration manager client is going to go in and eventually it's going to talk to the management point, and it does that usually about once an hour. And then what it'll do is it'll say, oh, we have endpoint protection settings on the client. So then it'll go and it'll attach and install the uh, endpoint protection agent. Then what it'll do is it'll go in and it'll start applying our policies. Now you'll notice that this has, this has an order. This right here is the order. This is a golf score. The ones on the top get applied in preference to the ones um, underneath. So you can have those. Um, the default policy is going to be 10,000. You can't change it, but um, we don't have it in here, so that's that.